right, well, welcome to World War One X and to an interview with Professor Carol McGranahan. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, you're, you're a professor at the University of Colorado yes. um, in anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about how you came to anthropology? What was your journey to sure. becoming an anthropologist? Right, so um, my journey to anthropology actually began, began in Nepal when I was an undergraduate student and I wanted to study abroad. And uh, which is very common among American students. However, most of the students from my university went to London or to Paris, someplace in Europe, and I uh, stumbled across a program that went to Nepal. And I, I didn't know anything about Nepal. I had never really heard of Tibet, but I read the description and thought, this is where I want to go. I had never taken an anthropology class. And I remember I got off the plane and just from within you know one hour of being in the country, was immediately captivated with seeing right from that you know, initial just stepping um, into what was truly not just a new country but a new world. And it was kind of my awakening in terms of realizing that it's not just that people around the world speak different languages or eat different food, dress differently, but have different ways of, of organizing life and, and living life. And so that semester in Nepal is, is when I became an anthropologist. So my mentor was the first Nepali anthropologist, Dorbista. And he actually sent me and I did a month of field work in a small village in southeastern Nepal before I'd ever taken an anthropology class. And then I went back to my university in the United States and became an anthropology major after already having done my own field work. So it was very learning unusual. Learning by doing. Yes, learning by doing. Fantastic. Right. And what did you study before? What was your background that well, I was interested in international affairs, okay. so I, I always had a bit of a global sensibility, but I hadn't, international affairs is pitched at the levels of government, mm. and anthropology is pitched at the level of, of people, right, uh, of actual people, and I didn't know anthropology had existed, I didn't know that was something I could do or, or, or that one could be, and the minute I discovered it, um, well, here I am today, <laughs> right, you know, and that was, uh, you know, 27, 28 years ago, so it was a while ago now. Fantastic. Yes. And then... You studied anthropology and then went mm -hmm. to graduate school. And, and yes. how did you choose your project? What, what was the, the process? You'd been to Nepal, but then mm -hmm. went back? Right. So when I was in Nepal as an undergraduate, I met a group of Tibetan refugees. And this was in 1989. And it was before um, the world really knew Tibet as a political cause. So Tibetan political activism had not yet become global successfully. And so I met a group of Tibetan refugees and what they told me changed my life. Um, as they said, told me the story of losing their country, which I will confess as a young 20 year old American, I, I did not know was possible. And that they had escaped from Tibet in 1959. So I was speaking with them in 1989, so 30 years later. And that in that 30 years, they had had no way of contacting family members they had left behind. They couldn't phone them. They couldn't um, send them a letter. And this was pre-internet, pre-mobile phone. So no way to text or email. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, I have a plane ticket back in Kathmandu with my name on it to fly home. I could make a phone call. You know, it, it was expensive, but you could make a call. And. I want to know what happened in Tibet and how have these people become refugees? What does it mean that 30 years later they are still here so disconnected and striving to get home? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it started. I started graduate school wanting to study about Tibetan refugees. And after my first year um, at University of Michigan, where I received my PhD, I went to Kathmandu to begin preliminary research. And I was interested in understanding what does it mean to be a refugee? This is kind of the question that I was posing. But also, how does that category become homogenized, such that all Tibetans were refugees, but internal variation, right? mm -hmm. being from one region or being a member of a certain religious school, got flattened out. And what the Tibetans I spoke with that summer told me is if you want to understand not just what it means to be a refugee, but what it means to be a Tibetan from a certain region or a certain age, then we have to talk about history as well. And so actually I went back to Michigan and enrolled in the anthropology and history program. So I have a PhD in both anthropology and wow. history from Michigan. And I think, I think history has come mm -hmm. up in a lot of interviews with a lot of people. And I think in, it's, it's inherent anthropology to understand yes. any place and people you have to know the history of both the place right. and the people there. Right, um, right, exactly. What happened and, and how, and how do people carry that history and those memories um, and, and the forgettings, right, that, that yeah. also are part of it. Also the, the construction of that history, right? right? Yeah, right. yeah. Um, now one question I always ask mm -hmm. is, you know, what is anthropology to you? How would you define, mm -hmm. to someone who doesn't know about anthropology, how would you define what anthropology is? Okay, so, uh, 
I think when I'm teaching, right, which is where we often really truly work out the definitions, right? How do we explain to a student? I often say something like, uh, anthropology is, you know, I have my standard definition, right? The study of human diversity across space and time or something. But they say, what does that mean? Um, it's really anthropology is, is the study and, and the revelation in the beauty of all the different ways that people live in the world and make and remake the world, organize it, come together, right, live together in groups. So that's, you know, it's really, it's, it's recognizing all of those and seeing those as um, not ranked, not hierarchical, but all possible, right? like all the, the various possibilities, limitless possibilities for living together in the world. Also about those multiplicities then of, of mm -hmm. being, of mm -hmm. engaging the world, I guess. Right. But it, yeah. from your definition, it sounds like a very active part. Um, you know, some definitions mm -hmm. are more structural or they focus more on institutions, but it's really yeah. about people and what people do. Right, I mean, culture is nothing if not people, right, or, or societies, right, and institutions are people coming together structurally. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I like to even take it down out of institutional or um, categorical realms just to, uh, you know, it has to be people who've chosen to come together for some reason, and, and often not conscious, right? Your, your choice might be, I was born into it, <laughs> right? I mean, which is so often, mm. almost always the case you know, in terms of um, the group to which you, you're often your primary association is. And in, in the work that you do with mm -hmm. Tibetans in Nepal and now also in the US, right. um, what role does anthropology play there in terms of, and, and I'd love mm -hmm. you to talk a bit also about, you know, anthropology as activism or anthropology mm -hmm. as engaged or public or or should anthropology be more cerebral and, and, and analyzing or you know where does anthropology fit in to right. a very politicized uh, you know yeah, area a, such as right. refugees right so I think actually we, we've seen changes in anthropology over the decades in terms of um, for example 20 30 years ago you wouldn't even be asking this question right of someone who, who you're doing an interview with and I recall when I was kind of an undergrad and grad student that the mantra sort of was more that anthropology is a predictive rather than a prescriptive right mm. discipline and the idea is that we um, we just we we document but we don't get involved and I think things have really shifted and some of it has to do with with advocacy in in the face of suffering and injustice that we see and bringing knowledge we have to bear on um, issues working towards positive change and ameliorating you know, real suffering. But others have to do also with, with not advocacy, but more um, speaking with and not speaking for. So to, to back now to the Tibetan case, it was really clear to me while I was doing my research that the concept of service and benefit mattered in the Tibetan community. So um, my dissertation research was in two parts, and one of the parts was the Tibetan uh, guerrilla army, Chushigandru, that was formed by citizens to fight against the Chinese communists. And in the space of exile um, in the 1990s, the way that people would talk about the sacrifices that the soldiers had made was in the idea of service, or often the phrase of pentogire, which means like to benefit, that the work they did benefited the community, benefited the Dalai Lama. And this came up again and again. And you know, as an anthropologist, when you hear something repeatedly, you're like, okay, I need to pay attention to this. And I thought this idea of service, this idea of being, um, of benefiting your community is something that I need to take seriously in my work, right? That my work needs to be of service and needs to benefit the community, right? And clearly not just the scholar, but also given that what I'm doing is coming from what, what matters to the community, right? Pay attention to history, uh, which is how I, you know, that became my entire career. Um, that's a working together, right? A working mm. with, not just a working for or working about. Mm. And so I think anthropology has really moved into that working together phase, um, which doesn't mean that we shirk from acknowledging power hierarchies or structural differentials or you know, the very privileged position of being a scholar, of being a professor, um, or necessarily from claiming the title of expert mm. when that's something that you need to do. I testify a lot as an expert in political asylum cases. And within that, you know, the structural system of the law, you know, a professor with decades of research in a community qualifies as an expert in a way such that your knowledge can truly make a needed difference in someone's life. In, in that kind of arena, in the legal arena, does it become an issue if you're an activist as well as an expert in terms of 
might it might right. it take away from you know if, if you're aligned with mm -hmm. a particular group or and and therefore your testimony might not be as unbiased right. or as I, objective <laughs> these I, are all loaded terms yeah no they're very loaded terms so i think that would matter um so as with anthropologists and people in general, judges and uh, immigration attorneys are not all created equal, right? And so they have their own ways of assessing expertise and of um, trying to to keep things like activism out of the court. So I personally, I feel that all teachers are activists, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an anthropologist, you. you you're acting in the world, right? In a way that's, um, this is a discipline in which we want to put our knowledge to use outside of the academy, right? And, and kind of be working toward a greater good, however universally or kind of generally defined. Um, but so I appear in court, um, I appear in court as a scholar. Mm -hmm. However, you might also say as someone who believes that anthropological knowledge is unique and therefore also speaking from the position that anthropological knowledge needs to be in a place like the court system, right? And so, I mean, you might consider that to mm -hmm. be an activist for anthropology, not even necessarily for <laughs> Tibet or, or, or for Nepal, but I really do appear without apology or without hesitation as a scholar. Mm -hmm. And how, how has your work, we've worked with Tibetans for a very long time, how, how has it changed over time, how do you think? Mm -hmm. In, in terms of interaction, in terms yeah. of the political situation, obviously. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's two things that have happened um, that I would really mark as changing. So if we could dock, say my scholarship has been a little over 20 years right, doing, doing this research. And <clears throat> the first has been the introduction of, of digital technology, so online technologies, and just the way that being able to communicate with people, first over email, but now really um, with the internet, with social media, whether it's um, WeChat, which is very popular among, among Tibetans, or um, Facebook or Twitter, but mostly Facebook for, the, for this particular community. What it's meant for me is that I publish an article, whether it's a peer-reviewed journal article, um, an online essay, perhaps a video interview you know, that goes up on YouTube, and my first viewers, my first readers are the Tibetan community. Hmm. Now, in my mind, they're also my first reader. Like, they are my primary audience, right? And anthropologists and anthropology students are, are audiences of mine as well, but my imagined reader first and foremost is always the Tibetan community. But now, because of that, you know, the quickness of, of digital um, technologies, they really are um, reading and sharing. And so there's this level of engagement, of questioning, of, of talking through ideas that is just, it's so, it's wonderful in so many ways, but it um, really has brought, I think, a new accountability into scholarship. So that's one. The second, however, um, is, is one that's, that's a sad, actually, occasion. So um, in 2009, a young Tibetan monk named Tape self-immolated in a uh, Kirti monastery in Tibet. And this was on the anniversary of a, a basically a crackdown, a, a fatal, deathly crackdown on, on the uh, monastery that had taken place by the Chinese army the year before. And his self-immolation was the second ever. The first had actually been in uh, Delhi in India in April 98. Actually, when I was doing my dissertation fieldwork, it's something I write about in my book, Arrested Histories. Uh, so that was 98, and we have one in 2009. And then starting in 2011, actually, a number of Tibetans mm -hmm. started self-immolating, and the number now is over 150. So these are um, individuals who have chosen basically to toast their bodies um, with petrol you know, and, and to set themselves on fire. And the idea is that it's, it's not a suicide so much as it is a sacrifice and both a, um, a political protest, a form of communication to, to Tibetans as well as the Chinese government as well as to the world, um, but it's a form of religious offering. And the idea is that in offering your body, as I interpret it and understand it, um, as an offering of light, which and fire, uh, a flame is on every single Tibetan altar. So mm. with it, when, whether it's in a monastery or whether it's in a private home, there is always a lit um, butter lamp. So fire offering. That offering yourself in this way will help to alleviate the suffering of those who stay behind, right? So of, of the living. And this, so I mean, self-immolations, right? 150 people killing themselves is, um, 
is, is weighty in all sorts of emotional ways, from senses of despair and sadness to confusion to anger. And um, scholars, as well as the Tibetan community, trying to figure out what to do. In 2012, in January, um, Ralph Litzinger and I, uh, Ralph's a scholar of southwestern China, Yunnan, and also Tibetan areas, were asked by Cultural Anthropology to put together a special issue um, of their journal, their online journal, speaking to this. And what can, again, anthropological and scholarly knowledge uh, do to help us understand what's happening and, and to make sense of this? And so we did this in a really fast turnaround time. I think. They emailed me in January, and it went live, I believe, like the first week of April. We had 20-something scholars who all responded to the call, who just came together, to, again, to figure out how do we speak to this, understand it, giving our own feelings of paralysis, our inability to do field work, hmm. um, trying to draw on what we know, trying to be useful, again, that sense of benefit and service, um, and to do so quickly. Right? and to do so ethically and responsibly, um, but to do so as a form of community that, again, this new online digital technology made available. And so that's kind of a concrete example of, of this new moment we're in, where I think the question of scholarly responsibility and... Mm -hmm. And response. And response, right, exactly. I love that. Mm. Response and responsibility. Mm. Given these new um, technologies and forms of communication we have, because this wasn't something that anthropologists, it wasn't just that we weren't doing it because we didn't have the technology before, but our thinking was slightly different. And there have been various stages in the discipline where we've been more politicized or, and engaged with what's going on in the world around us. And again, we're in, you know, I think, like, for the Americans anyway, is the space of the Vietnam War. Mm. Um, we're in one of those times again. But this real call to, to step outside of one's scholarly comfort zone and to engage with, with truly difficult acts and, um, and events. Because I think one of the things you, you, you've been talking about, this, the, the new media, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the one hand, I think anthropology brings with it a lot of nuance, which is often mm -hmm. missing in reporting. Right. But then we take a long time bringing it out, you know, <laughs> yeah. bringing it into the world. <laughs> and and right. so there's sometimes a disconnect. So bridging that gap is really important. Um, yeah. Being able to write in a more timely manner, I guess, no, Re being responsive to what's happening and being able to put something out. That's very true. Because I think we, you know, we have the nuance. We have more understanding. I mean, you're, you're, mm -hmm. when you describe the self-emulation, you've written for Savage Minds about it right. too that brings with it a much deeper understanding of what is going on than somebody who reads it in, in, in a newspaper because okay. it'll just be reported as a fact. Right. This happened, right. no explanation needed almost right. because it's self-evident. Yes. But it's but not, not self-evident. <laughs> and I think that's where anthropology has to, should come in and more. So, exactly. So here's where I think we have this opportunity now to do these short form kind of online essays and, and responses, but they're built on this deep scholarship, mm -hmm. right, that matures over the unfolding of time. So I actually, I, I was an activist before I went to grad school, and I remember when I left, my activist friends made me feel like I was going to the dark side. Right? That, and they're like, we're never going to see you again. You might publish a book in 10 years. And I was like, oh, no, no, that won't happen. Um, instead, I published a book in 17 years later. Right? <laughs> Um, but I remember saying, you know, activism needs to rest on a, a base of solid scholarship. And now, again, we have this opportunity right, to provide nuance, not just in a book-length form, but to supplement it with, say, a 1,000-word online essay that I put up tomorrow about something that happened today. Right? And then have the two working together in that complementary way. So I think we have real opportunities now, and it's up to us to figure out how do we use this moment and this opportunity Again, to kind of be an activist for anthropology and, and for an anthropological thinking mm. right, about the world. I like that, being an activist not just in and of itself, but for yeah. more nuanced mm -hmm. anthropological right. thinking. In the current world issue that you know, we're kind of talking about is refugees broadly defined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you've given us some concrete examples of how you're intervening in that space. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you think anthropology can do or should do, perhaps, in intervening in this, in this particular issue? Because we, always, we talk of a crisis, but there have mm. been crises oh, <laughs> forever, so, yeah, exactly. and it's just, you know, it's more of a media cycle than, um, it's an ongoing mm -hmm. issue. Right. Um, what, yeah. what do you think, I mean, you know, it's not just about responding to this one thing, responding to mm -hmm. that one thing. It seems to be 
such a large issue. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're here at a conference. I've seen so many panels that deal with refugees. So there are a lot of researchers out there mm -hmm. doing work. But what do you think anthropology's role is in and, and should be to tackle it or to? Well, I mean, I think what we specialize in are stories. Right. So in addition to nuance, is t to provide a, a kind of fully fleshed out human story that, again, has actual people in it. That's not just a story of whether it's a refugee or a Syrian refugee, but it's, um, you know, Hamid, or it's someone with a name. Mm. Right? And I think the ability of anthropology to do that um, without flattening um, human stories is something we can truly contribute. Now, how do you take a story and put it before a policymaker in a way that will translate into policy. Mm. Right, that's the, the, the challenge, really. Or how do you um, bring this into journalism? Right, how do you make stories efficacious in the world? Right, in ways that that perhaps um, structurally, symbolically, poli you know, policy-wide, that, that refugees need. Um, and here is where we fall into both the challenge, opportunity, and the danger of talking about refugees as a group, right? But also insisting on the need to, to parse that out and get into the specifics. And I think anthropology actually is really good about doing universals and specifics at the same time, right? So being able to, to kind of go up to that level of a universal category or experience and at the same time insist that we can only understand that through the particular. Mm. Right? And then putting those together sort of side by side, right? the, the, so that the, it, they can be seen clearly um, as individual kind of episodes and perhaps crises, but structurally as connected. I, I have to say, I've, in my writing, I've moved more and more into more personalized writing, yeah. precisely because the feedback has been people have been able to connect more. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's where the storytelling comes in. Right. It does connect people mm -hmm. with other people and yeah. their stories. Um, whereas numbers or just broad sweeping theoretical treaties are not as, not as good for that. No, no, they're not as compelling. And this is one of our, mm. uh, I think our disciplines struggles right now outside of anthropology is, you know, in many places there actually is a call for, for data as if data is only quantitative and numeric. Right, mm. and so uh, for us, or, or for scholars who, who want to be engaging with people for whom data is to, to have data is to problem solve, right? To have mm. a number will enable you to answer a problem, um, to show how it is that ethnographic stories are also a form of, of data, mm. right? In, in ways that we don't use in our field, but outside of anthropology has become a term that's, that has inherent in it, we're gonna solve a problem with this you know, mode of information. Do you think there's an issue of translatability in terms of data and what people expect from data? I think so, and so that's our job, you know, to, mm. to figure out um, if people feel that the answers they need reside in um, bodies of information that look different than, those, than the ones we produce, we need to figure out how to show that the bodies of information and knowledge we're producing are what they're looking for. Mm. Right. So I think the onus, the burden really is on anthropologists. I mean, in our field is... Probably it doesn't matter what country you're in, where you say, well, what is anthropology? Right? We still get that, that question so often. I get asked all the time, what do you dig? I don't <laughs> dig anything. Um, I talk stories. to people. I collect <laughs> stories. Right? I'm a keeper of stories. People trust me with their stories to hold them and to tell them. Right? That's my job. And that's a huge honor and responsibility and gift. You know, I feel very lucky. That's such a beautiful way to end and yeah. <laughs> a hopeful note um, for the future. Thank you so much, Carol. Oh, thank you.